When it comes to others listening to me, what frustrates me most when they don't listen to me is that it feels like they don't value me, my thoughts, and my time as much as they do the other thing that they're doing. Oftentimes, I'll try and have a conversation with maybe a superior at work, and they'll be on their computer rather than focused and engaged with me, which leads me to believe that whatever's on the computer, the email that dinged, is viewed as more important than whatever I had to say. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. Hi, I'm Oscar Trimboli, and this is the Deep Listening Podcast Series, designed to move you from an unconscious listener to a deep and productive listener. Did you know you spend 55% of your day listening, yet only 2% of us have had any listening training whatsoever? Frustration, misunderstanding, wasted time and opportunity, along with creating poor relationships, are just some of the costs of not listening. Each episode of the series is designed to provide you with practical, actionable and impactful tips to move you through the five levels of listening. So I invite you to visit oscartrimboli.com forward slash Facebook to learn about the five levels of listening and how others are making an impact beyond words. In this episode, we step into the kitchen we start to look at the recipe and some of the ingredients for level one listening. A big welcome to Nell, co-host on the Apple Award-winning Deep Listening podcast. G'day, Nell. G'day, Oscar. Thanks for welcoming. Just on my way here today, I was reflecting on that Chris Voss podcast, so the one with the hostage negotiator. Fascinating, really good. I think you know the main thing I took away from that was the importance of the how and what questions is so so valuable and something i know that i'm going to be going to be using so definitely check it out yeah episode 48 is chris and it took me a while to get him he's so in demand he's spoken at so many big locations got a great ted talk he's spoken at google he's a new york times best selling author and he does a great job of talking about high impact listening particularly when it comes to hostage negotiate so today, Nell, we're going to spend some time with the deep listening menu. We're going to look at all the five offerings that we have on the deep listening menu. So let's quickly look at what the five menu offerings are for listening. Level one, listen to yourself. Level two, listen to the content. Level three, listen for the context. Level four, listen for the unsaid and level five listen for the meaning like all great chefs and cooks like me i think it's the preparation that quite often makes a big difference not only how you prepare what you're going to cook with but making sure you got great fresh ingredients because i think the ingredients and the technique will bring whatever you make to life the same is true if you don't have great technique and you have stale ingredients or you have the wrong ingredients, the dish won't work. So it's all in the prep. And as the French would say, mise en place. And a lot of the time, the prep isn't even in the moment that you're doing the prep. For a lot of great chefs, they're preparing well in advance of the time they're assembling the meal together. The same is true, Nell, when it comes to listening listening at level one, listening to yourself. You see, level one is foundational. Level one means that if you don't have a great foundation, listening feels heavy, laborious, exhausting. And when we dive into the research, it pops up quite a bit. So, Nell, I know you've spent some time with the research. What are people saying there about what they're struggling with at level one? screams out to us from the research that people get distracted. It's just so many people seem to just find it a real challenge to be able to hear what the other person is saying. And as you know, you've been saying to me, Oscar, it's not about 
hearing the other listener, it's about, as you're saying at level one, listening to yourself. It sounds like Barbara who says, I struggle with the respect side of listening Mm. where many times I'm not paying 100% attention to what's being said because inside I'm thinking of either what I want to say about it or just thinking of someone else altogether. Yeah, and it also sounds like Kevin. He says, my struggle is often my phone being nearby. It's such a temptation. It sounds like Amelia as well. I tend to start talking before they completely finish what they're saying. They do the same in return. The conversation picks up speed. It's a kind of a thrill to talk fast and back and forth. Or Julie, my mind tends to wander when someone else is talking to me. My mind seems to go in so many directions. I'd like to quiet my mind and be more focused. Wow. Kate says, I struggle with not filling in the blanks the minute they pause. And then finally, Nikki, my all-time favourite kind of frustration. I struggle with being truly present in every conversation and cutting out the white noise. Sounds really hard, doesn't it? And I think for a lot of us it sounds hard because we just don't know. 2% of people have ever received any listening training. It feels hard because there's both internal distractions and external distractions as well. The internal distractions are the distractions in our mind. The external ones, like Kevin said, the mobile phone or the laptop or devices. Or it could be external with a car going by if you're in a coffee shop. So it feels hard because quite often we can get into this downward spiral now that we just race off in distraction. Our mind wanders and it keeps wandering and then we're completely forgotten we've got to come back into the conversation. So for me, it only takes a little bit of work to get the right foundations and this is the joy of working in training situations and speaking where you can show people just with a little change, all of a sudden everything opens up. Listening then becomes, rather than being laborious and heavy and difficult, it becomes light, it becomes effortless, it becomes easy. What's that noise? Coffee machine. Is it the coffee machine? Mm. Or or something coming through the air conditioning? No, she's the milk frother. All right, I'll just wait and you can give me the signal for him. I think she stopped frothing. Okay. Am I back into it? Yeah, she's got a coffee. Now, people always ask me for the one big tip. And the one big tip is the deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. And it could sound as simple as what Christina, our Brazilian foreign language interpreter from episode seven, talks about how she prepares for high dollar value mergers and acquisitions in the finance sector in Sao Paulo and Brazil. She's amazing. She speaks Portuguese. She speaks Spanish. She speaks Italian. She speaks French. She speaks Polish. Um, Interesting twist in her Polish story. Her mum fled post-war Poland and was a spy for the Polish resistance. And that's how she learned Polish as her grandmother taught her Polish over the dinner table in Sao Paulo. So let's hear from Christina about how she prepares for high stakes interpretation, which is done simultaneously as parties are speaking. Breathing is absolutely essential. Um, Part of my meditation routine, but when I'm in the room actually, when I'm about to start my, my, my interpreting is to take at least three or four very deep, deep breaths. Um, and I do sort of like the classic meditation uh, routine where it's like um, you Inhale for about eight seconds. You hold your breath for another eight. Exhale for another eight. And then wait another eight seconds to breathe again. Um, And I do that at least three or four times because this is super quick. And it also sort of helps relax, relax my muscles, relax my body, especially because if you're if your shoulders are tense or if your neck is tense, that also prevents you from um, allowing your voice to come out and to channel out more properly, too. You know, Um, so definitely breathing is key for me. Christina's pretty deliberate. She talks about almost getting into this meditative state. 
Equally in episode 15, where we heard from Lisa Lachlan Bell, she's integrated it into what she's done. Listen out how she talks about it in moving to a meeting room. I think in that movement towards the meeting room, for me it's about bringing in the focus of the brain, making sure that I'm present so I would be concentrating on my every step, feeling my foot land on the ground, feeling that movement. I'd also be breathing quite deeply so that I can actually feel that intake of breath and listening to my breath. So coming back in almost like a a little mini single point meditation as you walk down, you're just bringing that brain right into focus so that when you come into the room you are present and open to whatever is about to be delivered and receive it without judgment. So now a little bit of trivia about uh, Lisa. Uh, Last year's winner of The Voice in Australia was coached by Lisa. Oh, fantastic. I didn't know that at all. Building on that, Nell, I was lucky enough to hear a beautiful quote the other day. And the quote says, although it's nice to be quiet, it's more powerful to be still. So when I think about what everybody struggles with at level one, it's not their ability to be silent during a conversation. It's their ability for their mind to be still. Oscar, this is something that we've heard in the research and it's what people struggle with really at level one. I have read through the responses and people say things like how to stay focused when I'm bored and I'm not interested in caring about what other people say, staying present in the moment and engaged throughout. How do I ignore distractions? How do I keep my mind from wandering? How do I keep eye contact? How do I keep my personal bias from getting in the way? What happens when I judge the speaker rather than listen to them? What happens when I judge myself during the discussions? What's the role of the surroundings, the environment? And what if it's not the right time to discuss that topic? I wish everybody had as much time to go through the research as we have. You know, there's 1,410 rows in in the spreadsheet with lots of rich and powerful data. And it's been great to listen to you. So thanks for helping us out with the research so that we can construct these episodes specifically to deal with the issues that you struggle with the most. As Heidi said, 86% of people are stuck at level one. And what this podcast is designed to do is to help you get out of being stuck at level one. But to get out of level one, we need to build a strong foundation for you. So let's think about four ingredients into the recipe that is level one. The four ingredients are who, where, how, and when. Let's start with who. The who is actually not the speaker. The who is about you. A lot of listening literature from the 80s and the 90s and the active listening movements talks about being focused and fixated on the speaker. This is helpful, but it's not powerful and productive. You need to be available to the speaker. You need to clear a space in your own mind to make a space where the conversation can land. Now imagine if you were in a kitchen and there are dirty pots and pans still in the sink. Is that something you experience? That's something I only experience when my husband cooks. I am incredibly neat and tidy in the kitchen. (laughs) All right, so you're a cleanie and I'm a messy. So... Visualize my bench top then. So my bench top's full of knives. It's got vegetables everywhere. It's got bowls. It's got flour. It's got sugar. It's all over the bench tops. And it's really difficult for me to prepare effectively for a meal. So rather than me just preparing the food and doing a great job, which would happen for you, a really clean and well-prepared kitchen, sounds great. But For me, I spend a lot of time and wasted effort moving around and trying to find space on the bench top. And we haven't even got to the stove or the oven yet. And for a lot of us, listening is like the way I cook. 
we have all this stuff sitting on top of our heads. It's dirty, it's cluttered, and just like in the kitchen where we've got pots and pans and unclean knives and forks and mix masters, it's lots of extra work if you don't have a clean bench top to start off with. And our minds are much like a bench top. If we've got room to prepare, everything becomes a lot easier. But when people say to me, Nell, listening is hard, I often visualize me cooking. I'm not great at it. I don't do it often. But when I do, oh my goodness, what a labor it is. I spend so much time doubling up on effort. And for me, I think about people who are trying to listen and they're spending so much time doubling up on effort because they've got dirty pots and pans already in their mind. And it makes starting a conversation really difficult because your mind's cluttered and noisy to begin with. So when you start with you, you need to be in control. You need to prepare yourself as it relates to listening. It, it reminds me, Oscar, of you, know, you were talking to me about exactly this topic the other day. I was looking out my office window and I could see Andrew, who is our painter. So Andrew's painting the outside of our 1930s California bungalow in, in Bondi. And he's awesome. I've used him a couple of times before. And the reason I keep going back and using Andrew is he prepares. We know we need to prepare when we're doing any kind of DIY, right? And painting, you think, yep, we've got to sand the walls. We've got to sort all this stuff out. The interesting thing I found about Andrew when I talked with him about painting was that he said, you know, in these old houses, they've had eight or 10 years of layers of paint. Our house is 80 years old. And every 10 years or so, it's been had a layer of paint probably put on the outside. And these types of paints have changed throughout the years, and so they're going to have different compounds in them. And when he slaps the new paint on top, so the Dulux or Taubman's or whatever it is, what can happen is that new paint reacts with the older paint and it bubbles and it causes peeling, and the end result isn't great. So he really needs to prepare the surface. And I think there's a lot of in common with how you prepare yourself for listening. A lot of conversations can kind of peel and blister and you have to go back and do rework as well. So I think the prep, it's all about the prep. You know, when I think about a 90, 80 year old house in your case, yeah, how much rework would Andrew have to do if he didn't get it right? And for a lot of us, that's the work in listening. We don't do the prep right because we're not ready to create the space in our own mind for listening to take place. So level one, listening, we start with who? We start with you. So make sure that you've got space in your mind to be available to listen to what the other person's saying. The simplest way to do that is just take a few deep breaths. The deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. Equally, Preparing for a great conversation is about the second ingredient. The first ingredient is who, the second ingredient is where, the third is how, and the fourth is when. So let's spend a bit of time talking about what's the right environment for a great listening conversation. To increase the effectiveness of any conversation, what you want to do when you think about where you're having this discussion is how do you reduce the distractions? We want to reduce the distractions that we can see as well as the distractions we can hear. And for some people, reducing the distractions might mean simply putting yourself in a quiet kind of room. But Nell, there's another way to think about that as well. I think. A quiet room can be a fantastic setting for a meeting. I also noticed when I used to work at a large company, we were having back-to-back -back meetings every day, that you're going from meeting room to meeting room and there can be very sterile, very samey kind of environments even though you're changing a room. So one thing that I started doing was having what we came to call walking meetings. And that started when I was meeting with one of my direct reports, Sarah. And so Sarah and I used to meet every week and we would run through a typical kind of agenda of items and then we'd come up with 
what needed to happen next and she'd go away and, and the work would get done. She was great. Did you feel like you're going through the motions? Yeah, we were going through the motions and we needed to change that. I, I knew we needed to change that. So one day I said, hey, let's just get out of the office. It's a beautiful day outside. Look, you can see out of the windows from our office on Pitt Street, right down Martin Place. Let's just, let's just go for a walk. Uh, so that's what we did. We left the office, we walked up Pitt Street, we went up into Hyde Park and it changed the environment of, of the meeting and it changed the feel of the meeting as well because we weren't just talking about the rigid agenda items. What I noticed was that Sarah started to open up a little bit more about the business and about some of her opinions of things that were going on, which was really valuable information and she had a different perspective from my own, which was hugely helpful for what we were going through at the time. So whilst there were distractions and things going on because you could hear the birds in the trees and you could hear the water in the fountain, it wasn't the office distractions of some, the lift dinging, someone getting the coffee from the coffee machine, someone typing away, someone on their phone. It changed the environment and it was really positive for the things that we were able to share between the two of us it became more of an intimate kind of a conversation so do you think it kind of increased its effectiveness or its creativity it sounded quite organic and ironically while you're walking you actually have to be more focused than if you're at your desk because you, you you're literally focused on walking and while you're walking and talking, it's a pretty natural thing to do as a human. Coming up in an episode with Dr. Justin Coulson, he talks about if you want to engage teenage boys as opposed to teenage girls, you need to walk side by side with them rather than face to face. If you want to have a great conversation with your teenage daughter, of which he's got six, um, face to face is the way to go. But if you want to talk to a teenage boy, distract them with walking or give them a task to do like cutting up food or they might be cutting up. Um, plants in the garden as well so thinking about those walking meetings was it just with Sarah or did you do it with other people I started doing that with other people I think it, it's not something that's going to work with everybody and some meetings you do need to be in a room you need your laptop maybe for you know collaborating on some things together but these were our regular one-on-ones we knew each other well I trusted her to do the work actually what I wanted was her opinion on some things in the business and it enabled us to have this kind of creative environment where we could talk very openly and with one another without the office distractions around us by the way I'm going to really listen to that episode that's coming up with Justin Coulson because I have a seven-year-old son and I I think that I could use that with him, even though you say it's for teenagers, just sometimes being able, having that challenge of trying to engage boys, um, that sounds like it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, I reckon if he was in the room right now, he'd talk to you about having a chat with Finn while he's playing with Lego would probably be the way to go because I reckon yeah. he's at that Lego age, right? He's at that Lego age. He's also at that Beyblade age. Do you know what a Beyblade is, Oscar? No idea. <laughs> it's a modern modern take on a spinning top. And he is obsessed. So are all the kids in his class. So it's like the latest thing that's out there. I think that's a really good point because I do notice that when he's engaged in something that he's focused on, he can maybe free him up to talk about things with me as well. Great. And finally, coming back to the walking meeting with Sarah, I'm mm. curious what was different in your listening. You talked about hers, but what yep. was different for you? It gave me time to reflect on what she was saying and made me think about what I really wanted to hear from her, which wasn't just the things that were in our agenda. So following that formula, as you were saying, it's quite mechanical. It opened up my mind to asking more creative questions because the environment was different and it changed the dynamic. It became more friendly, more conversational. Mm. And what do you think it did with your relationship overall beyond the walking meeting with Sarah? Oh, absolutely changed the relationship and made it a lot more collaborative kind of rather than a boss directed report it became a much more of a collaborative relationship awesome all right so we've spoken about the first two ingredients we've spoken about who and we've spoken about where now let's spend a bit of time talking about how and when so now in front of you right now are the deep listening playing cards and 
If you haven't seen the cards before, they're organized into the five levels of listening. So think five suits, five distinct areas where we talk about listening. So each of the suits are organized into, in this case, level one listening. There's 10 cards that explain level one listening. And as you can see now, they've got that beautiful artwork from that amazing artist Bayou who created these for us. It's often commented on whether it's in the book or in presentations or on websites. People just love the work that Bayou did to create this amazing piece of art that helps people to listen to themselves. They are really beautiful cards. They just feel nice to hold in your hand as well. Yeah, and a lot of time went into thinking about not only the art, but the feel of the card as well. As you can see, they're oversized cards and they have a really unique feel to them. We've used a particular kind of glue and a particular kind of sheen cover there that a lot of people in workshops quite often comment as much on how the cards feel as how they look. And quite often you'll see them holding them to their chest um, almost to bring them close to their heart. So I think, yeah, they, they really capture emotion really well. So if we think about each card now, you'll notice it's got four categories on each card. The categories are organized into the concept, the explanation, the tip, and then finally a question. The question might be a question you need to ask yourself, or it might be a question you need to ask the speaker. So what I wanted to do was look at this particular card that we've got right now, which is called self-talk. And as you read out earlier on and listened to the research feedback, self-talk is a big distractor. It's a big derailer. It really gets in the way of people listening. So the concept is self-talk. The explanation is self-talk, the story in the listener's mind when they're waiting for the speaker to finish. Self-talk, the story in the listener's mind when they're waiting for the speaker to finish. Then there's a tip. It's a highlight. It's an awareness area. It says drifting into self-talk is completely normal. And what you need to do is just notice and reset and make sure you get focused back in the dialogue. I always say, Nell, the difference between a recreational listener and a deep listener isn't that they get distracted. I get distracted all the time. The difference is I know I'll be distracted and I've got tips and techniques to get back into the conversation faster. I often visualize um, those uh, rodeo kind of horse jockeys no that's not the right word i often visualize i often visualize those ra rodeo cowboys that uh, kind of get onto a bucking horse and the good ones know they're going to get knocked off it's how quickly they get back on again and for me getting back into the conversation it's not about pounding the sand when i've fallen on the ground going i'm distracted it's like okay so we know we're on the ground let's get back up into the conversation but it's the question now on this card. And it's a question that talked about your conversation with Sarah. And it's a question about when and how around the conversation. So the question posed is, is now the right time to have this discussion? Quite often, the right conversation at the wrong time is complete disaster. And the right conversation at the right time is completely transformational. So now when you think about these cards, uh, a lot of people interpret them one-on-one. -on -one. So your self-talk means you're drifting away by yourself. But you can often see that in group settings and meeting settings as well. Absolutely. I think you see it a lot in your average corporate meeting room where there's maybe seven or eight people. I, I see that a lot, that people are all together, but they're not really present. They're distracted by their computers, distracted by their phones that are in front of them and next to them. They're not focusing on what the other person's saying. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of the training scenarios that I'm brought into around listening, I'm being asked to train salespeople because 
they feel or their managers feel or their customers feel that they could improve their listening. A lot of them have training on how to figure out the budget. Uh, a lot of them have training on figure out who to talk to, but very few of them pay attention when they're in those conversations. And we use these deep listening cards in a, in a training program we ran. Um, it was uh, a beautiful location on the harbour in a national park in Sydney. And the leader talked about the fact that they took out one of the deep listening cards and said, I'm going to use this card for the next week. I'm going to look at it every day because this card, particularly this one on self-talk, was something that Stephen particularly struggled with. But what he did as a result by role modeling that, the team started bringing cards into the team meetings once a month. And they almost played listening bingo where they'd kind of call people out when they'd interrupt or when people were getting distracted or when their mind was drifting away. So sometimes I'm amazed where these cards get used. Um, equally, I'm amazed by the imagination of people to use them by themselves in a, in a situation with somebody else, in regular team meetings, in training um, I've heard of these cards being used in prisons as well as with principals in teaching environments. So um, the cards have all come about because of listening on a group of training that I ran where people kept saying to me, but you should make that into a card, Oscar. So again, another example where just listening to what people are saying would be interesting, but acting on it and turning them into cards has, has made it quite fun. It sounds like they're really simple to use as well. I mean, the information is all there on the card. I've seen people in offices where these are the cards up next to their computer or um, people bringing it into um, performance review discussions. Mm. Uh, I heard uh, a situation with Kevin about two years ago now where he went into the performance review with his manager and they were asked to do some self-reflection on how they perform throughout the year. And he showed the card to the manager and, and he said to her, her name was Alice, how do you think I've gone with this this year? And she turned to the card and she read through it and she went, wow, is this why your listening's changed so much over 12 months? Um, and in that moment, Alice kind of went, how's my listening gone in the last 12 months? So it opens up interesting conversations just by having the card there. So Deep Listening, the card series. Also, um, we've got the Deep Listening jigsaw puzzle, but we'll talk about that at another time. Let's come back to the foundations of level one. Let's talk about the four ingredients that make up what great level one sounds like, looks like, and feels like. So let's recap. Let's talk about the who, the where, the how, and the when. So let's remember, the who is you. The who is not the speaker. If you're not ready to listen to somebody else, it's going to be impossible, no matter what techniques you use in terms of note-taking or focus or fixation. If you've got a whole bunch of self-talk going on in your head, the likelihood that you're going to be an effective listener through the whole conversation is low. And if you do it, congratulations, but you're not going to be able to sustain it because it's going to feel heavy. It's going to feel laborious. What we want you to do is make listening light and energetic, engaging and fun. Point number two, where is the right place for the discussion? Whether it's in a quiet location whether it's a walking meeting, as Nell talked about earlier on, where you jump out of the office and go to a local park, or just the act of walking for some people through a street is more than enough to change the environment and keep the distraction away. The next one is how. How will you recover when you're distracted? Nell, we've heard over and over again from the research that we've done with Heidi, from the Facebook group, from the training courses we've done, all the various environments we can listen to everybody from, distraction is our challenge. So in our next episode, we're gonna stay in level one. We're going to stay focused on understanding what's getting in the way, what to do when you're distracted 
and how to avoid the derailers as well as how to engage with the derailers as well. We're going to learn how to dance with distraction. We're going to listen to Christina, a world champion military sniper from Sweden, who's going to talk about the power of focus and how you can stay in a conversation once you've noticed distraction. And then finally, as we talked about earlier on, ingredient number four, when is the right time to have the conversation? Sometimes the most powerful thing you can do when it comes to listening is pick a time to have the conversation that's effective rather than when emotions might be high or people's distractions are particularly evident. So those four things again are who, meaning you, where to have the conversation, how to have the conversation, and more importantly, how to recover from distraction, and then finally, when's the right time to do it. A shout out and welcome to the new people that have just joined the Deep Listening Facebook group, to Stephen and Merrick, Beck, Abe, Stacey and Ashley. I can already see you're starting to get some great conversations going with everyone else who's who's in the group there. Yeah, it was a great conversation between Steve and Abe and if you're in the group you can see it. But it talks to the impact of what happens when you're ignored and people don't listen to you, particularly as it relates to safety and what the consequences and cost of that could be. A huge thank you to you. Thanks for listening to the Apple Award winning podcast. And as a gift from me and Nell and from Johnny, our amazing sound engineer, we've created a simple, practical and useful downloadable called The Five Myths of Listening. Visit oscartrimboli.com forward slash listening myths where you can download it. Not only have we got the five myths, but equally we've got the five tips to get around those big derailers when it comes to listening. Thanks to you for creating the Apple award-winning podcast, Deep Listening. Impact Beyond Words, we couldn't exist without you. It takes a village to nurture a child into a healthy adult and it takes a tribe to create a movement towards 100 million deep listeners in the world. Thanks for listening. Listening.